Phil's a great person. He's warm and friendly. He's a very quiet guy, but when he has something to say, it's worth listening to. He is well-informed. He is engaged. He's a man of, of really powerful intellect who's done his own thinking since the very beginning. He's a one-of-a-kind type of person who has had a oversized impact on, uh, on the lives of millions of people, even though those people probably don't know anything about him. You know, this is a gentleman who checks all the boxes. He was a business entrepreneur. He's been a social entrepreneur, building successful nonprofits. You don't want to let a guy like Phil down. Phil Harvey is the youngest son of a farm tool supplier from Evanston, Illinois. After college, he traveled to India and observed abject poverty, a rapidly growing population, and a lack of access to contraception. For Phil, the developing world is not some abstract concept. He has been traveling there and been engaged with the developing world for decades now. Phil ultimately decided to do his graduate thesis on family planning in the developing world. He was a public health guy who was interested in public health. He and a colleague, friend of his, decided they would do a study and they put ads in, in college newspapers to figure out how, um, how they could encourage people to, to, to buy condoms through the mail. And it turned out that the, it, the response to the ads was overwhelming, um, much more than they anticipated. I think they lost a lot of money having to go to pharmacies to fill, to fill all the orders. But anyway, they, they took their research results, they got their master's degree, and a light bulb went off, and they said, you know, maybe we're, we're tapping into an unmet need here in the United States. And so maybe we should set up a company that actually does this commercially and use the profits from that to pay for programs overseas that would fundamentally provide the same products and services, um, you know, contraception and, and condoms to uh, women and men around the world. That mail order business for items related to sexual well-being became quite successful but ultimately put him in the crosshairs of government regulators. Neither our constitution, our courts, our people, nor our respect for common decency and human suffering will allow this trafficking in obscene material. In the 1980s, the U.S. government embarked on an unconstitutional campaign to effectively shut down the adult entertainment industry, of which Phil Harvey was one of the leading entrepreneurs. The way they decided to do that was by filing so many lawsuits at so many levels of government, not just federal, but also multiple state attorneys general, that they would be unable to defend themselves and simply fold. And the price of folding was basically shutting down their businesses. And they did, because you just can't fight the government on so many fronts, unless you're Phil Harvey. Phil had the wherewithal financially and the backbone and the principles to fight this. And he won. Yeah, when Phil stood up to the government and fought back, of course he had a lot of, uh, of, of his personal business was at stake. But I think even more importantly, he recognized the principles that were at stake and the, the contribution he could make to pushing back on the government and, uh, and expanding, expanding liberty. And it was the very first time in history that any court in the United States had ever entered an injunction against a government obscenity prosecution. He is one of the greatest contributors to freedom of speech, not only for sexual expression, but also for any controversial, unpopular speech. Every single one of us who says anything that is controversial or unpopular owes an unfathomable debt of gratitude to Phil Harvey. Something Phil understands so clearly is that the criminal law is a tool of control. It's a way for the government to control people's behavior when they don't like that behavior. And one of the things I really admire about Phil is how much he gets that and how effective he has been in pushing back against the government and preventing it from using the criminal law as a tool of control. I think Phil felt like he got screwed by the system. And I think once he got involved with the criminal justice system, he saw a lot of people getting screwed by the, their government. He could have had that experience and just been burned or angry about it. But instead, 
he found that there were organizations like ours fighting for people who didn't have those resources. You know, one of the special things about Phil is that he's one of these folks that is a generous supporter of liberty and liberty organizations, but he's also down there on the field, um, you know, running plays himself, writing books about um, issues that relate to uh, our policy work. Phil Harvey's been a supporter of organizations doing all kinds of important work. Cato, Reason, IJ, FAM, FIRE, uh, the ACLU, drug policy reform organizations. He's written books on reproductive health, sexual freedom, free speech, welfare, corporate welfare, and everything else the government is doing to you that you ought to know about. Not to mention fiction. People often say to me, like, how do you connect the dots between Adam and Eve and, you know, um, the Cato Institute and all these books that he's written and contraception. Like, how does one man do all these different things and like in his head make, make sense of it all, you know? And I think the common thread is this belief that people should be able to determine their own destinies, um, regardless of whether they're in the, ba in, in the bedroom, uh, regardless of what they want to smoke, uh, who they want to smoke it with or do it with, um, how they want to live their lives, and that there really shouldn't be a lot of other people impeding their ability to live their life to the fullest. And uh, I think that's the common thread. Phil and his wife Harriet spearheaded Cato's first ever art exhibit. One of the greatest things about the exhibition was to show that uh, Cato was, is, is a forward-thinking organization. So many people came in with very little knowledge about Cato and left with a true understanding about what this organization was about, that it's about liberty, that it's about freedom, that it's about engagement, that it's about uh, openness in the sense of allowing people from different points of views to come, to express themselves, and to have healthy dialogue and debate. And when you think about places around the world where people are fighting for freedom, Art is often the greatest messenger, the greatest deliverer of why freedom is so important. And I think when they saw the full range of uh, topics that were covered by the artists and the way they interpreted freedom, I think that gave people a great appreciation for you know, the full range of policy areas in which Cato cares deeply about liberty. Writing in his book, The Government Versus Erotica, The Siege of Adam and Eve, Phil Harvey has himself said of his journey, In the end, we were exhilarated by how we came to assert our cause and prevail against a federal force that was zealously determined and almost infinitely well-financed. That this remains possible in the United States is our greatest hope for a free future.